Is it Bill Bailey? mystery. <laughs> I used to love spaghetti westerns as a kid. Fantastic. All those meaningful looks and no real dialogue. <laughs> there he is, the man with no name, walking up the main high street. He's walking up to the saloon bar. The saloon bar of death. He walks in. Oh, sorry, mate. It's the wrong one, isn't it? Sorry, that's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> back in, back in the street. His finger hovers over the holster of his gun. He steps into the saloon bar. He stops to light his cigar. The tension is unbearable. Best 35 quid I've ever spent. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's a question for you. A tree falls in the forest. No one sees it. Does it make a sound? Huh? What do you think? Yes? No? Yes. Don't know? Don't care. That's a good answer. <laughs> Couldn't give a monkeys unless it falls on the picnic is a good answer. <laughs> Some philosophers might spend his whole life worrying about it. Doesn't make a sound, doesn't make a sound, doesn't make a sound. Just before he dies, ah, I could have been out drinking, having a laugh. <laughs> we don't know, do we? You know, I mean, maybe the woodland creatures let it down on a system of pulleys. <laughs> you know? Or maybe it falls on towels. So it just happens to be... <laughs> we'll never know. And we will never know, because even if there was an eyewitness there, it'd be useless. <laughs> it went... But I couldn't hear it, because I had my hat on. <laughs> All I got was... <laughs> like that. <laughs> the same thing happened to me. I was in the bedroom, I had a pair of socks, and I threw them into the laundry basket. Straight in, didn't even touch the sides. Nobody saw it. Now, that's not fair, is it? <laughs> A triumph like that. You know, it's always a way. You're driving along, cigarette, throw the cigarette out the window, it goes back in the back window, onto the passenger seat, burns a little map of the Seychelles, bounces up, flicks another fag in your mouth, lights it, fantastic! <laughs> On your own, lonely country road. <laughs> Only person to see it, little hedgehog swinging off a gate, playing the jazz trumpet. Like that. <laughs> nice cigarette work, man. <laughs> And nobody believed you. Yeah. But the thing is, you can't say that it would never happen. Because at school, I learned this, the law of infinite probability. And you probably remember this. It's fantastic. It's that, and the law it says is that if you get enough monkeys, right, enough typewriters, then eventually one of them will type a line of Shakespeare. Yeah. You see? And when you're eight, that just blows your mind. No, that is the most outrageous thing anyone's ever said. Wow, monkey type of... Ah! No. <laughs> but as you get older, you start to get a bit more cynical. And, uh, you know, your expectations, you know, get a bit lower. And eventually you end up with, well, if you get enough plumbers and enough boilers, then eventually one will be able to fix it. No. <laughs> but it's true, though, you know, sometimes things don't quite work out the way you planned. Oh, God. No, I, I don't. Bill. It's uh, Keith. Keith? Keith. 
Keith Pearson. Keith Pearson, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We went to Fitzroy School together. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we had chemistry. Chemistry. Yeah. Five A. Mr. Yeah. Hogg. Mr. Mr. Hogg. Oh, Whatever. Right. Warthog. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, so it's been a while, isn't it? Fifteen years. Fifteen, 15 years. Fifteen years. Fifteen really years. Yeah. It's amazing how time goes, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. 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 So, how's it going? <laughs> Maybe there is intelligent life elsewhere. We don't know. In that film, Contact, Jodie Foster receives an email from an alien. Because apparently now a lot of aliens are working from home. <laughs> Little sheds, you know. <laughs> Why are people so keen to meet aliens, though? You remember that solar temple death cult? They wanted to go up in a spaceship. They thought they were going to be taken up by aliens. And the night before they thought they were being taken up, they all packed a little bag. I'd love to have seen that. Oh, right. Yeah, got my hair dryer. Right, yeah. Oh, better take an adapter. Probably got different plugs. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, they might not even have electric. Oh, what am I going to do? Oh, I'll dry my hair out the window. Oh, can't do that. It's a vacuum. Get sucked out. Uh, better take an extra towel. <laughs> oh, you Brits are idiots. You know, you have to have a French spencer. Bumping into things, knocking things over, rollers going under the lorry. God, the guys are stupid, clumsy bastards. <laughs> five minutes back in the bush, somebody shoot the bastard for being such a stupid, bloody idiot. <laughs> Chuck him on the fire, a few pans of butter up his guts, rip his spine out, cover him in glowworms, wave it around, disco, beautiful. <laughs> Is that the airbag? How hard are you going to hit him? <laughs> <laughs> speed him up, look, look at that. <laughs> uh, I was stopping, mate. Get out. <laughs> Me. Get out! <laughs> you scary little poppy idiot! <laughs> <laughs> We are obsessed with the paranormal and the unexplained, and we look for science to try and explain this. But all they do is grow an ear on a mouse's back. Now, <laughs> that was very, very cruel. Very, very cruel. Also, there was the emotional cruelty as well. Because all the other mice filled it up with cheese and made him walk round the buffet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, our view of the future does change drastically as the years go by. And in the 70s, we considered aliens to be small pink socks that uh, survived on string. Now, <laughs> this was very, very patronising. And they were actually a lot more intelligent than we give them credit for. Oh, look, there's Tiny Clanger. What's she saying? Intellectual prosperity is the primary source of social change. <laughs> oh, look, there's Major Clanger. He's very angry. Damn your logical positivism, Tiny Clanger. The means of production is the determining force of history. Oh, look, there's a soup dragon. I agree with Tiny Clanger. Major Clanger is merely clinging to Marxist dialectic of social materialism. <laughs> Shut up. Bring me my bloody soup. Papa, don't speak to the servants like that. Be quiet or I'll cut off your allowance. Oh, typical ruling class. <laughs> Good afternoon. Cloyce Pocock, 42, Elmbank Lean. Beryl is my wife, thank you. I mean, we all know how cack-handed British engineering gets on a Friday afternoon. I saw that in a biscuit game. I saw a sponge finger once, three foot long. Custard cream, no custard in it. I saw a rich tea once, solid marzipan. Shocking. What worries me, though, is Friday afternoon genetic engineering. What cavalcade of the mutants is that going to throw up? They're meant to be cloning a donkey and all the time they're thinking about getting home for the prices right. <laughs> My cousin Les did a conservatory for a bloke that went to the same school as John Virgo. And he's a consultant. Uh, not John Virgo, because he does the snooker. I suppose he's a consultant on Big Break. But anyway, <laughs> he's a medical. And he reckons within ten years we'll be able to get cloning on the NHS. Imagine that. 
Eight barrels! <laughs> right, come on it. You know, one to cook the dinner, one to wash up, one to get the pudding, one to do the hoovering, one to make a cup of tea, two out in the garden, and one to, uh, you know, drive the car. <laughs> you can't say it'll never happen, because he said that about the cop. <laughs> This is the lounge. Study through there. Wow, it's an amazing house. It's really beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, there's another four bedrooms, all en suite. Sauna, steam room, full-size snooker table, and a garage for three cars. And it only cost you ten grand? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. So what are the neighbours like? Well, on that side, they moved out. And on that side, we've got... I feel very let down by the estate agent. He only showed us the property on the Saturday when the Foghorn factory was closed. <laughs> it has been quite... Why do we want to invent things? And why are there so many Scottish inventors? There's loads of them. Was it that the fact that young men were kept indoors and away from common pleasures by the cold austerity of the kirk? <laughs> and thus, this tiddling and fiddling around with old telephones, that led to a far superior education system? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> or was it my own theory, and that is that most Scottish people are actually from the future? <laughs> this is slightly contentious, I know. <laughs> But I do believe that in the latter part of the next century, a Scot invents time travel. And all of them move back here to this century for the far more lenient licensing hours. <laughs> I know, it's a tricky theory, I know. But I tell you why that this is true. Because a lot of Scottish people talk in a way that is actually from another century. Right? <laughs> way into the future, where they can predict time travel. I tell you what, you can spot them after a meal. You have a meal with a Scottish person, you finish a the meal, they look at you and they say, is that you? <laughs> uh, yep, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> then they finish, they push the plate away, well, that's me. <laughs> Oh, well, there we are. You get up to leave, is that you awake? <laughs> when they get up to leave, that'll be me up the road. <laughs> they're already up the road, they're in the future, that's why. Dorian and Steve are the inventors of hide and seek. <laughs> Well, originally the concept was just hide, 
but it was difficult to know how popular it was. There was no way of telling how many people were playing. It was when the Sikh element was introduced that things really took off for us. Yeah. Which was a shame, really, because I always thought that Hyde was the more superior game. Yes. It had an exciting zen quality. You could play it by yourself, and as an only child, it was a more enticing prospect. The public demand for our creation was insatiable. Mm. We were lost in the stampede that I had the urge to seek. Hide and Seek became so popular that we developed a board game version of it. What you have to do is throw the dice and one player covers his eyes while the other player hides his counter. Then the other player has to try and find it. As you go around you can buy different objects to help obscure your counter. Bean, leaves, plank. Never really caught on. <laughs> Hide and seek was such a success, we found it very hard to scale those heights again. We tried other games. Twiggle, King of the Hutch, Monotony, like Monopoly, only set on contaminated waste ground with no planning permission. <laughs> Blump. What was Blump again? You know, the two spotted balls and the large green hanky. And you had to put the hanky over the rotating tubes. No, no, you had to pick up the dice with the special tongs, throw the dice to eliminate the player to your left. Oh, and then the dotted balls were soaked? No, first you had to elect Captain Twiggle, then soak the balls. <laughs> yes, then you had to choose between Blump or Dash with no pickups or reset the dolly clock. Oh, if he goes Blump or Dash, he must collect six Pronto vouchers before the dolly clock is repossessed by Major Muggle. <laughs> I'm knocking, I'm knocking. Blump. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I was playing Monopoly the other day, and uh, I picked up a chance card, and it said, You are Nietzsche. Your entire philosophy was espoused by the Nazis and cynically manipulated to suit their own diabolical ends. Miss a go. <laughs> I've never had that one before. Right, this next joke is set in the 1950s. Three chaps toddle into a cosy wayside inn. I say, barman, could you furnish us with three pints of your finest ale? <laughs> no, I would as like as maybe, sir, but the ale's been and gone and gone off. <laughs> Hell, well, that's a right rum doing, no mistake. I'll nip down to cellar square, see if I can sort it out. Right, Hell. I say, you chaps, there's a working class fellow over here. He's an absolute hoot. <laughs> Toddle over here and we'll listen to the quaint and charming way in which he speaks. I say, Barbara, any luck with that ale? No, oh, blimey, Governor, I've been on my plate to meet all blinking day, if you'll pardon my French. <laughs> you see, it's charming, isn't it? Out my plate to meet all blinking. Yes, that's enough. Yes, that's enough. Yeah, thank you. So, any luck with that ale? No. Oh, and he fell over a barrel. Oh, look, they said, we've got him over a barrel. Ha, 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 ha. And they laughed heartily, although the scowl on the barman's face hinted darkly at a sea change in the sociological attitudes that would one day threaten their cosy wealth and overturn the notion of class <laughs> Sometimes 
I'd like to stay in a normal house. But we're safe here. Yeah. Tommy Steele owns all the land. Well, he said we could stay as long as we wanted. <laughs> Now, I used to do a bit of modelling. Yeah. Right. yeah, I used to be a burglar model for alarm magazines. I'll tell you what, though, it's a lot harder than you think. Bell. 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 Yeah, just give me the door. Yeah. Uh, you know. I'm getting a kind of a rhythm going now, yeah. Maybe it's like a more uh, totemistic thing, you know, like a yeah. Brazilian La uh, I'm the kind of spirit of the jungle. I'm trying to get in, into the tribal enclave. Maybe it's like a tomb. Maybe no one's been in there for thousands of years. Oh, yeah. Um, that's it. Maybe I'll lose the blacks. I go for sort yeah. of market belt, earth. Belt. Put that here. Yeah. What? Like that. Great. <laughs> great. Belt, just look there at the camera. Look at the camera, Bill. Yeah, that's great. Great. Right. Do you think this better club than that? Yeah, it's fine. What about this? No. <laughs> Just about the bar, Bill. Just about the bar. Come on. That's it. That's great. So, I smashed the window. Uh, what am I now? Just a shadow on the patio. Shadow on the patio. Shadow for myself. Shadow of form of patio. Uh, maybe I'll come back to the garden. No, no, put my finger. I like that, the roving, thieving eye. Look at that. Bars. I'm trapped in a cage. It's just a hand shot. Just a hand shot. Uh -huh. Right. Just my hands are doing the robbing. OK, they're acting independently. I don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. Just they... pick up the pedals. What? Like that? That's it. I'd have that as well, surely. <laughs> right. I'm running. I'm getting away. Right, that's it. What? I got away with it? Yeah. Yes! Oh, shit. That's blown it. <laughs> Don't you change it. Try to please me. Mmm. That's a lovely chord, that. That's a mood chord. You know that? That says, smug, doesn't it? Mmm, <laughs> smug. Often uh, found in conjunction with the patronising chord. <laughs> and ironically, both of these can be found in the ITV sport theme. <laughs> smug. <laughs> now, chords can depict a lot of emotions. Uh, one chord can suggest suspense, like this one. <laughs> Instant suspense. And that can apply to all genres. You imagine that in Scooby-Doo, for example. And romance, that's easily done with a few chords. <laughs> oh, Ambassador, you are spoiling us. <laughs> Angelin, dude. Hey, it goes all cockney there, cut that bit out. Yeah. <laughs> that's where it pans around the room, there's a bloke from Dagenham going, What do you mean, spoiling us? The 299 from Menzies! <laughs> Get about the garage. What you talking about? <laughs> With films now, you can actually tell a lot about the plot just by hearing the opening music. I mean, for example, if you hear this kind of music. <laughs> you're thinking, there's a nut around here somewhere, isn't there? <laughs> Where is he? Where is he? Oh, there he is, up there. <laughs> In the car, with his knuckles whitening on the wheel, the rain lashing on the roof. He's staring into the big house in the Hollywood Hills. He bears them ill will. <laughs> but inside the house, of course, they're totally oblivious, listening to a bit of light dinner jazz. <laughs> I 
and the host is helpfully explaining the plot. As a rich advertising executive, I've been ruthless in my drive to the top. I only hope there's no psychotic ex-employee who bears me a violent grudge. I think there is, mate. This kind of film is not new. Uh, this could have easily been done in the silent era. The same plot, the nutter, in the car, in the jalopy, the rain on the roof. But the music, of course, will be slightly different. The music will be like this, wouldn't it? A little bit of black car with a white writing. Look out, it's the nutter! <laughs> but inside, Totally oblivious. <laughs> and now, the news in the future. <laughs> Conflict. Compromise. <laughs> Resolution. <laughs> and now, the weather. <laughs> Here's the main points again. That'll be me away. <laughs> we kept a photographic record of some of the best games. Well, I was behind the tree there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a good one. Dorian has a great genius for hiding. He buried himself under the rockery here, mm. with just a little hole for breathing. Breathing. Mm. In the shed. Compost heap. Yeah. Under the bed. Bed. They're in cupboard. Cupboard. Bin. Post box. Post box. Hole. In the, in the hole. Snow. Snow, that was, that was a cold game, wasn't it? Bruh. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't hear it because I had my hat on. Like that. The same thing happened to me. I was in the bedroom, I had a pair of socks, and I threw them into the laundry basket. Straight in, didn't even touch the sides. Nobody saw it. Now, that's not fair, is it? <laughs> a triumph like that. Yeah. It's always a way. You're driving along, cigarette, throw the cigarette out the window, it goes back in the back window, onto the passenger seat, burns a little map of the Seychelles, bounces up, flicks another fag in your mouth, lights it, fantastic! <laughs> On your own, lonely country road. <laughs> Only person to see it, little hedgehog swinging off a gate, playing the jazz trumpet. <laughs> nice cigarette work, man. <laughs> and nobody believed it. Yeah. But the thing is, you can't say that it would never happen. Because at school, I learned this, the law of infinite probability. And you probably remember this. It's fantastic. It's that, and the law it says is that if you get enough monkeys, huh, enough typewriters, then eventually, one of them will type a line of Shakespeare. Yeah, you see? And when you're eight, that just blows your mind. Yeah. <laughs> that is the most outrageous thing anyone's ever said. Wow, a monkey type ah! <laughs> <laughs> But as you get older, you start to get a bit more cynical. And, uh, you know, your expectations, you know, get a bit lower. And eventually, you end up with, well, if you get enough plumbers and enough boilers, then eventually one will be able to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's true though, you know, sometimes things don't quite work out the way you planned. Uh, Keith. Keith? Keith. Keith Pearson. Keith Pearson, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we went to Fitzroy School together. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we had chemistry. Chemistry? Yeah. Five, Five A. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Hogg. Mr. Hogg. Whatever, Ward Hogg. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so it's been a while, isn't it? Fifteen years. Fifteen, Fifteen years? Has it been that long? Yeah. It's amazing how time goes, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how's it going? Oh, look, there's Major Clanger. He's very angry. Damn your logical positivism, Tony Clanger. The means of production is the determining force of history. Oh, look, there's a soup dragon. I agree with Tony Clanger. Major Clanger is merely clinging to Marxist dialectic of social materialism. <laughs> Shut up! Bring me my bloody soup. <laughs> Papa, don't speak to the servants like that. <laughs> Be quiet or I'll cut off your allowance. <laughs> oh, blah, 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 blah. typical ruling class. <laughs> Good afternoon. Cliff Pocock, 42 Elmbank Lane. Beryl is my wife, thank you. I mean, we all know how cack-handed British engineering gets on a Friday afternoon. I saw that in the biscuit game. I saw a sponge finger once, three foot long. Custard cream, no custard in it. I saw rich tea once, solid marzipan. Shocking. What worries me, though, is Friday afternoon genetic engineering. What cavalcade of the mutants is that going to throw up? They're meant to be cloning a donkey and all the time they're thinking about getting home for the price is right. My cousin Les did a conservatory for a bloke that went to the same school as John Virgo. And he's a consultant. Uh, not John Virgo, because he does the snooker. I suppose he's a consultant on Big Break. But anyway, he's <laughs> medical. And he reckons within ten years, we'll be able to get cloning on the NHS. Imagine that! Eight barrels! <laughs> you know, one to cook the dinner, one to wash up, one to get the pudding, one to do the hoovering, one to make a cup of tea, two out in the garden, and one to, uh, you know, drive the car. <laughs> you can't say it'll never happen, because he said that about the cop. <laughs> And this is the lounge. Study through there. Wow. It's an amazing house. It's really beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, there's another four bedrooms, all en suite. Sauna, steam room, full-size snooker table, and a garage for three cars. And it only cost you ten grand? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. So what are the neighbours like? Well, on that side, they moved out. And on that side, we've got... I feel very let down by the estate agent. He only showed us the property on the Saturday when the Foghorn factory was closed. <laughs> it has been quite... there is intelligent life elsewhere. We don't know. In that film, Contact, Jodie Foster receives an email from an alien. Because apparently now a lot of aliens are working from home. <laughs> <laughs> Little sheds, you know. <laughs> Why are people so keen to meet aliens, though? You remember that solar temple death cult? They wanted to go up in a spaceship. They thought they were going to be taken up by aliens. And the night before they thought they were being taken up, they all packed a little bag. I'd love to have seen that. Oh, right. Yeah, got my hair dryer. Right, yeah. Oh, better take an adapter. Probably got different plugs. 
Oh, they might not even have electric. Oh, what am I going to do? Oh, I'll dry my hair out the window. Oh, can't do that. It's a vacuum. Get sucked out. Uh, better take an extra towel. <laughs> French spencer, <laughs> bumping into things, knocking things over, rollers going under the lorry. God, the guy's a stupid, clumsy bastard. <laughs> he was about five minutes back in the bush, somebody shoot the bastard for being such a stupid, bloody idiot. <laughs> Chuck him on the fire, a few pans of butter up his guts, rip his spine out, cover it in glowworms, wave it around, disco, beautiful. <laughs> Is it the airbag? How hard are you going to hit Speed him up, look, look at that. Why are we stopping, mate? Get out. For me? Get out. You scared little puppy idiot! <laughs> we are obsessed with the paranormal and the unexplained, and we look for science to try and explain this. But all they do is grow an ear on a mouse's back. Now, <laughs> That was very, very cruel. Very, very cruel. Also, there was the emotional cruelty as well. Because all the other mice filled it up with cheese and made him walk round the buffet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, our view of the future does change drastically as the years go by. And in the 70s, we considered aliens to be small pink socks that uh, survived on string. Now, <laughs> this was very, very patronising. And they were actually a lot more intelligent than we give them credit for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, there's Tiny Clanger. <laughs> What's she saying? <laughs> Intellectual prosperity is the primary source of social change. <laughs>
We'll never know. And we will never know, because even if there was an eyewitness there, it'd be useless. Odd. <laughs> Janine's not coping very well. You see, it's not just the noise. It's just that you never know when... You just never know when... You just never know when... It's just you never know when... It's gonna stop. I'll be back. Why is it that we humans want to better ourselves? Why do we want to invent things? And why are there so many Scottish inventors? There's loads of them. Was it that the fact that young men were kept indoors and away from common pleasures by the cold austerity of the kirk? <laughs> and thus, this tiddling and fiddling around with old telephones, that led to a far superior education system? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> or was it my own theory, and that is that most Scottish people are actually from the future? <laughs> this is slightly contentious, I know. <laughs> but I do believe that in the latter part of the next century, a Scot invents time travel. And all of them move back here to this century for the far more lenient licensing hours. <laughs> I know, it's a tricky theory, I know, but I'll tell you why that this is true. Because a lot of Scottish people talk in a way that is actually from another century, right? Way into the future, where they can predict time travel. I'll tell you what, you can spot them after a meal. You have a meal with a Scottish person, you finish a the meal, they look at you and they say, is that you? <laughs> Uh, yep, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> then they finish, they push the plate away, well, that's me! <laughs> oh, well, there we are. You get up to leave, is that you awake? <laughs> when they get up to leave, that'll be me up the road! <laughs> they're already up the road, they're in the future, that's why! <laughs> <laughs>